Welcome, um, thank you very much for uh, coming to our talk in yet another gorgeous day uh, in Vancouver. I uh, hope you are having a good time. This is the work that um, I have done with my colleagues at IBM Research. Uh, they couldn't be here, and uh, so I'm going to present the work. Uh, let me start with uh, a little bit of motivation and what uh, motivated us to start this work. And then I get to a brief overview of Neutron very quickly to do a level set. And then we get to the main part of the talk when we talk about network performance, the benchmarking framework we are proposing, and we show some empirical results and look at those and uh, end the talk um, with conclusions and future directions. So Neutron has been around for some time now. It has uh, become, uh, uh, it has uh, got to a point uh, of usability and stability that people have started uh, working on it um, and using it in production. Uh, sometime during the last cycle in February 2nd, uh, DevStack merged a patch that made Neutron the default networking for OpenStack. And as you can see, a lot of Neutron people were extremely excited, um, only to see the patch get reverted three days later. And um, what happened there was that the community thought the default configuration of Neutron is still too complicated for some users. And it's not closely matched with what people have been using in Nova Network. And we need to do some work around getting to a default configuration that is much closer to what Nova Network supports, or it is, in general, simpler. So there has been a lot of ongoing work. There have been at least three design summit sessions that I have been to where we have discussed uh, with Neutron community and Nova community, what are the uh, issues in terms of making Neutron more accessible uh, to everybody. Nevertheless, Neutron is your networking in OpenStack. So we thought um, the first question that comes to mind is how does it perform? Um, and we are talking about different aspects of Neutron and from the management plane to control plane to data plane. And we wanted to answer that question, and that motivated our work. What are the important networking metrics we should look, look at? How do we uh, measure them? And uh, before I get to answering some of these questions or start the discussion about these issues, I want to just very briefly talk about Neutron so we are all on the same page and then get to the discussion about benchmarking Neutron performance. So Neutron provides just the API for network virtualization. It has a core API and some extensions. I have listed uh, the important ones, and there are some others, but I just want to keep it simple for our sake of discussion. The main uh, abstractions are networks and subnets and ports. And um, uh, if you have your VM connected to a network, you expect it to be able to talk to other VMs connected to the same network. And if you want to talk across networks, you expect to have Neutron expects you to create a logical router where you provide connectivity services between different networks. And by doing connecting two networks into a router, you can uh, have the VMs talk to each other across networks and possibly to the external uh, world. And the router extension also provides floating IPs, uh, so you can uh, be accessed from the outside. And uh, I have listed security groups as one of the more important uh, extensions that uh, one need to use to provide the level of uh, security we need at each port level. This virtual 
abstraction, this API needs to be realized somehow in the real world. And that is done through the plugin architecture that Neutron supports. So depending on how those plugins realize these sets of logical resources, you may end up with different uh, properties in terms of performance that uh, can be important. So uh, you could use, in terms of realizing the Neutron API and implementing it, you could uh, rely on what the operating system that the hypervisor networking stack provides. You can be using different types of tunneling. You can be deploying a controller that uses OpenFlow. And there are all different types of technologies that you may end up using in, in order to implement that API and that uh, abstraction. There are several um, back-end or plugins or drivers available right now. Uh, the reference implementations are the famous OpenV switch and Linux bridge uh, plugins. To be more accurate, mechanism drivers uh, that are used through the ML2 plugin. And um, there are several open source options that I have listed, a few of them. Open Daylight has been around for some time and there have been presenting uh, in this summit and have been integrated with OpenStack. There is Midonet, Open Contrail, uh, OF Agent from Rui, Ryu, and um, Oven or OVN. So these are open source options that are also available as your plugins and backends. And then there are commercial solutions, and there are a few of them. I, decided not to list in case I miss someone. Um, there are different releases, and even though the API remains the same for the most part, or the backward compatibility is a big issue across the networks, uh, in terms of enhancement that gets done at the control plane or in the reference implementations, there are implications, whether you are using Juno or Kilo, or as some operators using even earlier um, releases. And very soon, in a month or so, we will hit the L1 uh, milestone. So there are lots of options. And uh, for all of these options, uh, there are some knobs to tune. And the question that we wanted to answer is that how can we come up with the framework that uh, can be used to um, see how these different options perform, different choices we have. Um, whether we use it out of the box, or we have to tweak it or um, adjust it uh, in our environment. How do they com compare? Um, that's why we thought we need a performance evaluation uh, framework. So what would be the major components of such a system? Um, very simple, we thought we need workloads where you uh, want to apply to your cloud and uh, see, for example, how uh, your Hadoop application um, uh, perform. So an, a workload can be uh, something like a Hadoop running uh, a terror sort operation, or it could be more simpler, synthetic, uh, using the networking tools that we have currently, iperf, uh, netperf, and so on and so forth. And then for each of these uh, workloads, you may want to have different scenarios. You want to do this across 100 compute nodes or less. Do you uh, want to um, have your communication between these nodes if you are using synthetic benchmarks in a particular pattern, just point to point? communications or something more. So that's what we call different scenarios. And then you need a harness, some way of doing all this, right? Some way of uh, standing up your VMs and uh, making them execute the workload that you are interested in. And collect the data, do the cleanup, and all that. And by doing so, you want to get some performance data that I will 
talk uh, uh, about shortly. And eventually, you want to come up with some figures of merits. Say that in this particular setup with these options, with this particular plugin, and the environment that I use, I could provide a scalability to a certain level. Uh, I could gracefully uh, deal with increase in load. Uh, something that can be um, translated into a simple number, but signifies uh, something much more. So that would be the ultimate goal. So what are the performance data, and where do they come from? Uh, obviously, there are different places to collect the performance data. Um, the obvious places are the VMs that you are using to run your workloads. And uh, ideally, you want to be able to also collect the performance data on the compute nodes that are hosting those VMs. And the things that you want to collect are uh, things that are um, you are all familiar with, CPU utilization, memory utilization, network activity, so on and so forth. And then there is data that you want to um, collect from your application and see that you achieved certain amount of work in so much time, things of that kind. And you can do that, obviously, per VM, or you want to be able to aggregate all this across your workload. So we wanted to have an open source um, framework. Um, we wanted to have a ideally multi-cloud performance uh, benchmarking tool where we could compare uh, the results across different types of clouds. Uh, whether you run the workload uh, with OpenStack or something else, then you would be able to kind of compare and have a better judgment about uh, what is going on. In terms of networking, we have focused on OpenStack so far only. Um, so we want our uh, results to be reproducible. So if you have a similar environment uh, using the same workloads and same scenarios, you should be able to reproduce the data. Um, and the future goal is to somehow we come up with this automatic uh, uh, estimation of these figures of merits. Now I can look at the graph and say that, oh, it looks like things are scalable. Uh, but we want to automate that as well. And that's something that we are working towards, um, not there yet. And automate the network configuration part as well. So. The tool that we are using is called CB Tool. Uh, we call it CloudBench. Um, it has been around for some time. It is what is being used by the spec organization. And hopefully, by the end of the year, spec organization will have a, a spec for cloud. And that will be uh, utilizing the CB Tool. And, um, it already had um, non-network centric kind of workload in it, uh, developed by our, my colleagues uh, at IBM Research. And now it has contributors from outside IBM as well. So it's a collective effort to make this part of this spec uh, benchmark. So we thought this is a good tool that has um, some credibility uh, and that's the place to start with. And I just want to go very quickly over a couple of sample results that are generated automatically with this tool. You can start different workloads. As difficult as it is to read this, the dotted lines are when the workloads arise, and you can specify that, and the VMs get instantiated. Those are the uh, solid lines, and the measurements, which is latency, in this particular example, get measured. And you can have concurrent workloads getting executed depending on a particular uh, arrival distribution and all that. Um, you can also collect the data, as I said, from your VM or your host and um, keep that for later reference. CPU utilization, the first thing that you want to look at. So, with all that as the way of introduction, what are the network-specific uh, 
additions that we have added. He said, let's start small. Uh, we have uh, used three obvious networking uh, metrics, throughput, latency, and data loss. Um, we have just a few workloads, uh, standard um, networking uh, tools, iperf, ping, um, netperf. Um, we have a specialized um, workload which um, uh, mimics video over IP streaming, and uh, that also is something that we have, uh, we are going to use. And we have different scenarios. Again, there are so many things you can do. We are starting uh, with a small set. We, in terms of networking, we can communication between the VMs. Uh, we are limiting it right now to point-to-point -point communication and communication in a ring. So if you have, let's say, 10 uh, compute nodes, you can have single VMs on them with one flow coming uh, out of each VM. Uh, you can specify a scenario where you have multiple flows between these single VMs, and you can have multiple VMs and uh, multiple flows. So these are the scenarios we uh, looked at. Uh, the problem space is rather big, so we used a small uh, subset of the problem space for this talk, uh, I'm going to present even a smaller uh, a set of data just to give you an idea about uh, where we are. So we wanted to use uh, the standard reference plugins or drivers, OVS and L uh, Linux Bridge. We have measurements with some open source um, controllers, such as Open Daylight and some commercial ones, but uh, we thought we have uh, too much data to uh, include all that, and uh, it's better to kind of get the point across about what we are trying to establish here, rather than having uh, an overwhelming amount of data. So we wanted to work with the latest releases. Um, most of the data I am going to present, uh, to present um, comes from Juno, and some from Kilo. And uh, we used VLAN, VXLAN, GRE, whatever uh, is available through those two uh, reference drivers, OVS and Linux Bridge. And uh, we wanted to measure all these uh, network metrics across, uh, within a single network, across networks, for getting to the external uh, network, and so on and so forth. And the systems that we used um, use um, standard Ubuntu 14.04. Uh, the Linux kernel is 2.3, obvious that comes with that distribution is 2.0, and we have, um, the hardware we use is Intel Xeon uh, 2 sockets with 16 uh, or 32 hyper-threaded cores and 256 gigabytes of memory each. So we have a cluster of these nodes with uh, this software, and we I'm going to skip these slides where I show how OBS and Linux Bridge um, drivers work in terms of uh, where the security groups are specified and whether you use tunneling or VLAN and so on and so forth. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, there have been talks that have gone through this um, already in this summit. So we started with the base setup, the software that I uh, described and the hardware that I mentioned. With the Juno release, we said, let's start with VLAN um, as our baseline, see how close to the um, uh, line rate we can get. We both uh, drivers, OVS and Linux Bridge, with one flow, we get to around 9.3 uh, gigabit per second on a 10 gigabit uh, per second interface. So we said, oh, that sounds reasonable. Uh, Let's uh, look at the impact of having multiple flows now, uh, sharing the same uh, interface, uh, look at the impact of security groups, compare uh, VLAN with GRE and VXLAN, and also uh, the, uh, look at the impact of distributed virtual router. 
So in the baseline, we use, we use just the L3 agent. So this is one of the set of data where uh, we use iperf, that's the workload, uh, 20 uh, TCP flows within each pair of hosts, and we have, I, I, for this case, we have three hosts. We have different sets of uh, tests on, depending on the number of uh, compute nodes, but this is a representative uh, uh, result. So um, we get around 400 uh, megabit per second um, per uh, flow. We have two flows on each link, so that gets us to around eight gigabit per second on each link. Linux Bridge performs a little bit better, um, not by much, but uh, nevertheless, it uh, provides a better performance. So we said, okay, let's increase the number of concurrent flows and um, keep the number of VMs as one in each uh, uh, host that we have and let them communicate with each other in a ring, if you remember, as one of our scenarios. And uh, as you can see, the performance remains between eight to nine gigabit per second as uh, we increase the number of flows to something around uh, 60. So let's further push this and see how far we can get. And um, after we passed 120 flows, it, I noticed a significant drop in uh, the, fl uh, the, perf the throughput that each flow was receiving, each flow was receiving. And that happened uh, more or less in the same fashion for Linux Bridge and um, OVS drivers. Pairwise latency, um, we did the standard ping and also used the iperf UDP run frame uh, measurements, again, comparable results. What I'm showing on the left is the graphs that I have generated, but uh, CB tool provides something uh, like what you see on, the, on your right, uh, where uh, when the workload arrives, it takes around a minute or so for the VMs to get up uh, and start communicating and performing the operation uh, and reporting the results. And, the results are generated automatically also, the graphs. So what about packet loss? Um, that's what, where we saw some difference between Linux Bridge and OVS. Um, if you look at the numbers, uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but you see the max and mean and the average, the bars show the average and max and mean, and the, uh, you see the 25 percent, 75 percentile box in the middle. Um, if you look at the numbers, statistically, they are equivalent. The mean max kind of overlap. Uh, but um, the mean in uh, Linux Bridge uh, is much smaller. Um, and this is for this particular um, test. Um, and the amount of data being injected is such that we are going beyond the capacity of the network. We just wanted to see how many packets get dropped. And as you can see, Linux Bridge uh, does better here. And when I say Linux Bridge, I'm referring to the Linux Bridge mechanism driver with ML2 plugin. So the idea is that we could do all this with different uh, plugins, commercial, uh, non-commercial, open source, um, not to necessarily um, uh, limit ourselves to these two particular reference implementations that may or may not remain the reference implementation. So what about throughput across network? The results uh, we got as I expected, where we get around 400 megabit per second for each flow if we have 20 flows to get us to around eight gigabit per second. When we go across networks, we get around 150. And this is with L3 agent in Juno. So uh, I want to emphasize that this is where we are we have collected this data. Um, obviously, as you increase the number of, uh, I think I disconnected myself. Um, as we increase the number of networks connected to the router, you can expect further degradation. The, and the problem of uh, 
L3 agent is well known to the community and there have been significant amount of work to address that problem and that's an ongoing uh, effort and I will refer to the numbers that we have with distributed virtual router towards the end. Nevertheless, this is the baseline, this is what you get out of the box. Um, for getting out of the uh, network using floating IP or um, uh, network uh, address translation, uh, for getting out and for getting in, you uh, again get uh, a fairly low uh, performance and um, you get fairly comparable performance among uh, these two drivers. What is missing, uh, I think, from these results that uh, we have, but we haven't uh, presented here, and we need to analyze is whether this equivalent performance is achieved with the same amount of CPU utilization, or there is a significant difference between these drivers in terms of CPU utilization. Um, we have some numbers. Uh, we have all the numbers uh, for all these experiments, but I simply ran out of time to put them uh, here, we will provide them. Uh, that would be the biggest um, uh, uh, piece that we need to add. While we, that would be an indication how these perform under further uh, pressure, right? Um, what about the security groups? So if the number of flows and number of VMs communicating with each other, other is a small, um, there is not much of an impact. There is a significant impact on the control plane, and I'm not presenting those data. I mean, if you go back in um, Ice House and it started hundreds of VMs, the system will crash eventually because of the problem. And those problems were addressed in Juno as you create more and more VMs. Um, it takes more and more time to get those VMs up and running, but the degradation is much more graceful. And I'm sure there have been improvements in Kilo. But with Juno, if you increase um, the number of uh, flows and number of VMs communicating with each other, um, you get um, a significant drop in the throughput. Um, and here we are not talking about hundreds of flows and hundreds of VMs. And when I say here, uh, multiple VMs, I'm talking about 10, 20. Multiple flows, 10 flows per VM. Um, so this is a closer look of the data that we collect. Uh, I just want to draw your attention um, to the fact that you cannot read the scale. But if you could, the scales are different. This data is from um, Juno again, I want to emphasize that. Um, on the left-hand side, you see without security group, I, you have to believe me, we get around 800 megabit per second for this particular workload scenario that we are uh, uh, looking at. And as you can see, the variation of the performance we get across flows is limited. With security group, not only we see a drop in the performance to something between um, 300 to 500 megabit per second as opposed to 800, now, you, as you can see, different flows in the same experiment get a, a very different um, uh, share of that uh, bandwidth. So there is much more variability as these security groups uh, are being added. All right, uh, I want to leave some time for a discussion at the end, so let me uh, hurry up. We have uh, done very little with GRE and VXLAN, as expected, on a single flow with single VM, you get much lower performance with uh, encapsulation, GRE or VXLAN, pretty much the same. As you increase the number of VMs or flows, you get to utilize more and more, and beyond a certain point, the CPU utilization kind of uh, becomes such a bottleneck that the performance drops significantly. Again, um, these numbers are without any hardware offload. Those are the things that one could try. And 
if you have been through the discussions, the community is, as a whole, is aware of all these issues. These are not uh, unknown, and there are solutions that uh, makes you use the encapsulation at a different level of your network and use VLANs at the lower levels with hierarchical port binding and things of that kind. And um, of course, you have the adapters that do some uh, work for you to improve the performance. Um, with DVR, we wanted to do it with VLAN. And with VLAN, just to establish the baseline again, um, we um, got very impressive numbers. Uh, across networks, we get around 9.2 gigabit per second. So very close to what we get within a network earlier. It turns out that in our setup, after several uh, uh, tests, the performance degrades. So we are talking to the DVR uh, people who have developed those who have developed the support for Kilo, uh, for uh, VLAN, which is just added and in Kilo to figure out what the problem may be and if there are uh, bugs that needs to be addressed. Um, so, what are the, some of the lessons we learned? Um, there is a, in setting up something like this, you have to deal with all the problems that you may have run into as an operator uh, of standing up large number of VMs. And then for benchmarking, if you need hundreds of VMs, you have to decide what to do if some of those VMs don't come up. Do you continue the benchmarking? The workload allows that or not? If some of those VMs come up, but you don't have network connectivity to them, what you do, and then how you clean up the mess afterward. So these are the things that you have to worry about. You have people or customers or users who are tied to a particular older distribution for various reasons. That has significant impacts. If you're using certain uh, uh, versions of the Linux, the uh, networking stack is at at a stage that you will notice significantly less performance. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, there we have experimented with OVS 2.3, which is the latest. Um, sees slightly better performance. Um, we were using in our setup double VLAN tagging. And uh, we were puzzled about the high, uh, high, low performance that we are getting. We still don't know exactly why people do double tagging. Maybe we weren't uh, doing it right. But uh, we used the tool to look at the performance utilization and notice that uh, a lot of our um, uh, machines uh, are having cores running at 100%. Um, as soon as we got rid of the double uh, tagging, uh, we got in a better state uh, where we could get the maximum or close to maximum rate. So in general, um, I just want to emphasize this is a framework. It's just at the early stage, we need to add more uh, workloads, scenarios. And um, we presented the results uh, uh, for OVS and Linux bridge drivers. And the performance is, for the most part, comparable. We need to do a better analysis of CPU utilization and see if there is any difference between these um, implementations. Uh, security group in Juno uh, still was a problem. Uh, we will do the same in Kilo and see if some of that, those issues are solved. And there are other solutions that avoid using IP tables altogether. And there were a talk just this morning about that that may improve the uh, state of affairs. And um, with that, where do we want to go uh, beyond uh, what I have already said? Um, we want to see if we could use a setup like this to help the development team. Uh, for the most part, we use single node testing. Uh, Infra has a multi-node, uh, to be accurate, a two-node testing environment that we can use. But that is certainly not um, suitable for performance testing, as it is done in a virtualized environment, and you are already running within VMs, and those are connected to each other through uh, tunnels. So um, 
we see, I mean, in the community, people identifying things that are probably source of the problem and do some testing and say, yeah, it looks like this is a problem and probably we can solve this by doing this. Uh, this could be something that could be used while that is happening and help the developers to um, uh, figure out what are the bottlenecks and if the solutions they are providing are having really uh, significant impact. And the way I can see it, and it is, can be totally off, uh, is, uh, is that it is used as a uh, third party kind of CI that is used selectively uh, if you need to kind of um, use that for every single patch, you really don't need to do that in, in terms of performance analysis. And with that, um, I just want to uh, see if there are any questions and uh, if you find any of this of uh, any interest. Hi, thank you for that. That's very good. Sure. Um, so you've talked a lot about the, uh, the high-end performance that you're seeing in terms of pretty close to saturating a 10 gig right. connection. Um, as it turns out, when you kind of dig into that, one of the big reasons for that is segmentation offload. Um, you end up with you know, tens or hundreds of kilobyte packets on average being passed around, and that speeds things up tremendously. If you, dis if you disable that, you actually end up dropping down to about maybe one gigabit a second max. So do you have any... Um, plans to have any tests like that in your test suite to cover the use cases where it's not possible to use TSO? Uh, we are open to adding any workloads and uh, please talk to me and uh, let's see if uh, we can add that particular workload ourselves or we can use your help to doing that. Uh, we were more than happy to uh, expand it. This is, as I mentioned, this is a very small set of uh, scenarios mm -hmm. and uh, we hope that we can expand it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Slightly related, um, you mentioned uh, hardware offloads, and this is something my company does. I want to be able to measure the offloads. For example, RDMA offloads. Ceph is supporting RDMA. Right. Do you plan to start benchmarking that? So that's uh, something we have to decide. All of the machines that we had uh, were equipped with uh, adapters that had offloads. Uh, we didn't use it for this set of uh, tests. That's certainly a possibility. Then the question becomes what kind of uh, uh, environment you want to use or what adapter or what kind of offload. And that's certainly... Uh, I'm talking about uh, VM, the SRI or VO offloads, uh, VLAN and VXLAN offloads. Uh, absolutely. Anymore. Definitely. That's something that we uh, will consider. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll follow up. Thank you. Yes, please do. Yes. Uh, thanks. Uh, um, given you have the, the background in development in this domain, uh, how complex is it to set up this test infrastructure and get these test results? Is it a one person, one week effort or? Extremely <laughs> easy. We have we instantiate OpenStack like it's nothing. Uh, it's better than anything else. No, I. The, the tool is rather straightforward. It has a nice GUI. Um, I would say it is something that you will learn to use in a couple of hours easily. Um, there are a lot we can do to make it easier in terms of introducing new workloads and scenarios. Um, uh, but as it is, um, it is very straightforward. Um, the big, bigger part is the standing of the OpenStack environment. And again, for that, we use our, our tools, and uh, that is the much more complex uh, 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 operation than just doing the benchmarking. Okay, thanks. Sure. Is there any plan to collect data so it's going to download that quantum to do that back, survey style? Uh, so we don't have that plan, but if uh, this is used to spec, that's how things are done there different uh, users and companies publish the results and they're collected there. Whether we will end up doing that or no, I really don't know at this point. Yeah, but definitely that would be helpful, right? Yeah. I forgot to ask, what about historical data? Do you have a mechanism to store and look like last week, last month? Yes, all the data, I'm being told that we are out of time, but all the data is stored in the database at the end of the operation and it is uh, preserved. 
Thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Ladies.